Let's dive straight in. The first one is when a man says, your feelings are not my problem. Now, more subtle examples of this would be, your feelings are not my responsibility. I'm not responsible for your feelings. I can't help your feelings. It's dismissive of feelings. And sometimes, the trick with this one is sometimes, on a logical basis, it can make some level of sense. If a man says to you, well, your feelings are not something I can control. I'm not responsible for your feelings. You sort of look at that statement logically and you think, can't really argue with that one. That's a bit of an issue. But emotionally, it doesn't feel right. Something is off about that. Well, you are being gaslit, not because the guy's likely intentionally doing it. I'll explain the trauma and wounding he's probably coming from in a moment. But let's talk about first why that statement is wrong. When a man says, well, I'm not responsible for your feelings. Your feelings are your responsibility. Why is that sound right, but is actually wrong and feels wrong? It's the difference between responsible for and responsible to. I became a new parent recently, and I'm obviously responsible for and responsible to my child, my beautiful baby girl. But as she gets older, I will be less and less responsible for her. Once she turns 18, 25, at certain ages, kids take responsibility for themselves. But as her parent, I will always have a responsibility to her. There will always be elements of being a father that will make me responsible to her. If she has a, maybe she needs support or help, emotional validation, those types of things, I will always be responsible to her as a dad. Well, partnership is quite similar in that we have things we are responsible for and responsible to. Mostly in partnership, we're not responsible for our partners. Okay, we're responsible for our couch, we're responsible for our pets, we're responsible for things that don't have their own autonomy. But a human adult, we are not responsible for them, and that's why this statement technically sounds right. But where it is wrong is the man is not having responsibility to the relationship. His boundaries are closed when they should be open. We always think of boundaries as you should be saying no, but this is an instance where the boundary fault is in he should be saying yes. When you are someone's partner, when you verbally agree to be someone's partner, you have agreed to be the number one person in their life that's responsible for meeting their needs. Needs mean safety and security, connection, autonomy, validation, importance. You are the number one person that is responsible for helping your partner feel safe, validated, secure, autonomous, etc. That doesn't mean you need to do any particular thing, but it does mean you're going to support them in getting their needs met. That's part of being a partner. And that's where when someone says, I'm not responsible for your feelings, technically and logically they are correct. But the mistake they are making, the mistake the man is making here in his logic is he is not taking responsibility to the relationship and to you. What he should be saying is, well, or what he could say if we wanted to kind of still use the argument is, while I'm not responsible for your feelings, I am responsible to you for showing up to this conversation and hearing you. So let's talk about it. As your partner, he does have that responsibility to the relationship. So what's the psychology behind this? Why do men do this? Well, men confuse responsibility for and responsibility to, usually because they've been made responsible for someone in their past and they felt responsible for that person and they felt inadequate because you really can't be responsible for someone, especially a human adult. And that feeling of inadequacy and I was never able to do enough for that person comes up when you share a feeling. Let's take the classic example, which is a boy who's been made responsible for his mother's emotions. You can't control your mother's emotions as much as you can control the weather. You can sort of frantically figure it out and try, but most of the time you're going to have some degree of failure. And for a little boy, that basically means he's failing his mother and he's failing as a son. Those feelings of failure are very strong. It doesn't even have to be with a mother. It could be with an ex as well. If he's chronically tried to be a fixer with an ex and her feelings, you know, they're okay for a while and then they fail again and he's just running on this treadmill that's speeding up, speeding up, speeding up and he's falling on his face, getting hurt every time he tries to fix her feelings. Well, now he has this pre-existing wound about taking responsibility for someone. So when you come to him and you share a feeling, a true feeling, not I feel like you don't care, I feel like I'm not important. I'm talking about a true feeling here. I feel sad, I feel hurt, I feel disconnected, I feel discouraged. You share a true feeling and suddenly he goes, ah, I'm not responsible for your feelings. What he's really doing there is he's protecting himself from that autonomy wound, from the failure that he felt in whatever prior relationship he had, mother or ex, where the woman did want him to be responsible for her feelings. Now, 
the line between responsible for and responsible to has been completely blurred in his mind. He doesn't realize there's a difference there. And so he backs off and he's not able to be open to you with being responsible to you. One thing you can say in response to this is, I don't need you to be responsible for my feelings. I only ask that you're responsible to this relationship and to helping find a way to get our needs met together. Would that be something you're open to? Let's go to number two. Number two is, I never complain. When a man says, well, I don't complain. I never complain. Why are you always complaining? Another nasty one that is very, very tempting to make you want to give up your needs and shut up. Unfortunately, that's exactly what the guy has done. And most of the time, that is why he's saying this. Men are often taught to push their own needs down, to not hurt the woman. And for a man that loves you, he doesn't enjoy hurting you. Bringing up conversations that hurt a woman is not fun for 99% of men. So what's likely happening here is you are much better at voicing your concerns and your complaints than he is. With men, our complaints can often, A, they're more related to space than connection, and B, we often communicate them with actions instead of words, which is not a good habit to be in. It is part of our, we're predisposed to this as part of our bi biology, but to be in a healthy relationship, we need to really find a new way of being. So as a man comes to a relationship, to get his need for space met, he tends to pull away more, he tends to go quiet, and over time, you become a lot better at speaking to your needs than he does. Eventually, this builds up on him, and you get this, I never complain, why do you? Responses to this include, number one, well, we have a bit of an issue then, because if you're not complaining, it either means that A, you're really just super happy, and I'm not, in which case we have a disbalance in our relationship, or B, which I think is more likely, is you don't feel comfortable complaining with me, or you're not actually complaining enough, either because you don't feel safe doing so, or because I've reacted badly in the past, but our complaint communication channel has basically shut down. Which problem do you think we have? You then put it back in the guy's court and he can help you fix this problem and hopefully be your teammate in fixing it. Bottom line with this one, men are often raised to believe we shouldn't complain, we shouldn't have needs, and we shouldn't hurt the woman through conflict. All three of these lead to you complaining a lot more than him and the presenting, you, you, you hear this, the presenting complaint is, well, I never complain, how come you do all the time? The temptation for you as a woman is to adopt his habit and go quiet. What we want instead is for him to step up and be more talkative with you. For that, he's going to need a safe space. He's going to need to feel like a contributor to the conversation. And he's going to need to not feel like he's under attack. So use plenty of pauses, go slow with him, but really be curious. So what do you think this is? Do you think it's that you just have no complaints? Or do you think it's that maybe you do have complaints and I'm pretty annoying sometimes, but maybe you don't feel safe because you don't want to criticize me or you're worried about my reaction? Really good way to deal with that one. Hopefully that helps with the I never complain gaslighting. Number three, you're a priority, but this is an obligation. Oh, oh. So man, so you, you are saying, hey, I, it would really mean a lot to me if we could spend more time together. Um, I'm starting to perceive that I'm not as much a priority compared to X, Y, Z. It would really mean a lot to me if we could change that. And he says, well, babe, you are a priority, but this is an obligation. Okay. What a man is basically saying here is that he does not or is not aware that he can set boundaries with the thing he is talking about. Now, you have to use your intuition a little bit with this one, because if you're asking him to spend every day with you and he has a sick mother, then he may use this phrasing to simply say that actually this is going to be a priority. You're not going to get to see me every night. Where I see this lead to gaslighting is when a man says something like, well, you know, you're a priority, but my kids are an obligation. AKA, I don't know how or am unaware that I should set boundaries with my kids. The result of this mindset is that you will just keep being deprioritized because basically if something's an obligation, then it rules him. If something is a priority, then he is choosing it. So the thing that rules him is always going to come before the thing that he chooses. So this mindset is very problematic because he's basically playing victim to whatever he's saying is the obligation. Now, as I say, again, you have to use your intuition a little bit because if his child is sick that day, he may use the phrasing, my child's illness is an obligation or, you know, going to court or some big thing is an obligation. He may use that when he's actually saying this is just a higher priority on this day. 
But what you shouldn't have is this chronic thing of him picking a particular, you know, boating is an obligation. Playing tennis is an obligation. Doing whatever my kids want me to at all times is an obligation. I had a guy that did this recently with adult children. And it's like, no, man. Kids at that age are not an obligation. You need to set some boundaries with them if you're going to make the woman in your life feel valued. So responding to this is basically that. It's essentially saying you need to start, you need to start setting some boundaries with this obligation if you're going to want to keep me in your life. I can't play second fiddle to this obligation 100% of the time. So if you can't set boundaries with it, then basically it has all the power. And I'm sitting here powerless. So is there a way that you might be open to starting setting some boundaries with that obligation? Or is there a way that we can find a different way to get my need met? Because if the answer to both those questions is no, I don't know how much longer this relationship is going to last. This will reframe plant, this will reframe the idea of obligation, plant the seed there that actually maybe this is not something that's an obligation, rather a priority for him. And again, use some common sense with this. What You want to use this when a man is saying this to you all the time. If it comes up once in a blue moon, then he's likely just setting a boundary with you, but he's using the word obligation in a slightly inappropriate way. What he really should be saying, if it's a once in a blue moon thing, is, babe, you're a priority. Tonight, my sick child is a priority, is the priority. Or, babe, you are a priority. Unfortunately, tonight, going to court or doing X, Y, Z is a higher priority. That would be the more appropriate way to phrase it. So when I say the man's saying something's an obligation, I'm saying he uses this all the time in a way that ultimately is seeing your needs go unmet for a long period of time. Uh, number five. What was number five? I forgot number five. Oh, number five. You made me do this or this is your fault. I had one recently where a woman came to me and she said, you know, Mark, I know I've not been at my best in conflict with this man. Unfortunately, now that means he is spending more time with the female friends and colleagues that I had a problem with in the first place, but now he's not even telling me about it. He's not even saying, hey, I went out and hung out with them. This is a big problem because she, in this case, had unfortunately untrained or passively untrained the guy to confront her. By punishing a man every time he does something you want, you train him not to do the thing. However, now the man is saying, well, I'm not telling you stuff because of you, because of your reactions and because of your behavior. That's not really a good way to present it. And worse, I hear men say, well, I'm not doing this or I am doing this because of X, Y, Z. Anytime you assign blame to something outside of yourself, you are making yourself the victim and powerless in that situation. And so when a man says, well, this is your fault I'm doing this, or I'm behaving this way because you made me, it's a... It's toxic. It's a very slippery slope into now we're not having the conversations that we should have had with the conflict that was appropriate. And instead we're going into, I'm doing, we're, we're tic-tacking each other, where you do this, I do that, ping-ponging off each other. The solution to this one, well, first the male psychology behind it. The male psychology is that he doesn't know how to set boundaries with you. He doesn't know how to have those difficult conversations and or he doesn't want to hurt your feelings and or... He's given up on having those conversations. He's resigned. So you have to kind of intuit which of those it is. After that, he's now starting to shift blame off himself. And the, the remaining psychology is he is not taking responsibility for that decision. He's not saying, well, your reactions were in such a way that I no longer felt safe or comfortable sharing this with you. He's basically saying it's your fault. So we want to make sure that a guy is taking responsibility for his decisions. In this situation, the best thing you can say is, okay, I'm happy to take responsibility for my end, and if we're not having these conversations because of something I've done, I'll take responsibility for that. However, we both have to be responsible for ourselves, and it's really important we don't blame each other for our own actions. Would you agree? From there, you can either get buy-in. If he says no, then you have a real issue with a gaslighter. If he says yes, okay, we can both take responsibility for our actions, generally you showing up and doing that first will help him do the same. So if there is a part that you've played, you can say, look, I will take responsibility for doing this part. Are you okay taking responsibility for your part? Let's come back together and figure this out. If he's completely in denial that he has any responsibility, no, no, I'm not doing this, I'm doing this because of that, and he's constantly assign assigning it to external circumstances, yeah, that's not a good sign. That is not a good sign. You may want to um, consider moving towards an end to that relationship because you're always going to have a guy that it's signs that he's not able to take responsibility for himself or his life. That's a problem. Number five, if you loved me, you would... Yeah, that's not a good one either. 
this forces you to choose between doing the thing that communicates love in the person's language or not doing the thing which you are now aware your partner is receiving that as you don't love me. In other words, you're being positioned as a non-loving partner if you don't do this exact thing. It's loss of self, loss of good character, loss of love, or loss of your own autonomy because you have to do the thing. It's a really toxic phrase and a bad position to be put in by your partner when someone says to you, if you loved me, you would blank. You want to respond to this firmly while still making sure that you believe the best in your partner until you've been proven otherwise. A good way to respond to this can be saying, hey, when you say that, it positions me as either having to do the thing and not having a choice, which scares me, or I feel worried that I'm going to be perceived as an unloving partner. In other words, I either lose my choice or my lovingness. So it would really mean a lot to me if you phrased your request in a different way. Maybe if you asked me if that's something I'd be open to doing rather than saying, if you love me, would you? Hopefully the guy comes along with that and he just had a bad moment. But if a guy really sticks to this, no, nope, no, nope, if you love me, you'd treat me this way. How do you set boundaries with that? You basically either have to be a non-loving partner and defend the fact that you still do love your partner, even though you're not doing the thing, or you have to sit up, shut up and do the thing, even though you don't want to. Really not a good saying, big gaslighting one, strong sign that the conflict and relationship boundaries is, is very shaky if you're hearing that in your relationship. Number six, I did blank for you. How can you keep asking for more? I see, unfortunately, too many instances where men are using this to gaslight the person they're talking to off what she actually wants. Oh, I took you here. How can you want more? Oh, I set you up with this thing. How can you want more? I took you on a date this week. How can you want more? Now, again, you have to kind of use some common sense with this one. If a guy is not feeling appreciated, if he's doing a genuine lot of things for you and there's a story within you that he doesn't love you, then what might happen here is the guy does things and does things and does things and he's trying to help with your feelings, but eventually he's getting so much criticism that he gives up. And he basically just says, I did all this for you, babe. Like, how can I do any more? So there can be some legitimacy to this one. What I'm talking about here is the gaslighting version. The gaslighting version is when your needs are not being met, is when you know deep down that this is not a relationship you could live long term in this way, you know he's not treating you well, and then he throws this one at you. He says, I'm doing all this for you, how can you want more? I'm doing this for you, how can you want more? I'm doing this for you, how can you want more? At the end of the day, what matters is your needs. If your needs are being met at a seven, eight, nine, or 10 out of 10, then there are going to be some things that he can't do. And there's obviously already some things that he's doing well. But if your needs are being met at a level three, four, or five, then this is gaslighting. And you can't let this, well, I'm already doing this, how could you want more? It's basically telling you to diminish your needs. And you cannot buy into that frame. You have to be solid in the fact that it's okay I have needs, my intimate partner will be the person who meets them the most, and I'm, I will not live with them at a level three, four, or five. And number seven, this is a bit of a dangerous one, is when a man says you shouldn't need that or it's not fair to ask for that. Any time someone says you should or shouldn't need something, be very skeptical about that. Needs are essential to the human psyche. And when I say needs, I'm talking about emotional needs, safety, security, love, connection, autonomy. I'm not talking about a good morning text or a bunch of flowers every Tuesday. I'm talking about core needs. These are the things that you are always allowed to value. And I recommend always holding those things in high regard. Now, how you get those things met specifically by a specific man is a different story. You can obviously ask for them in your specific love language, but a man may struggle to provide them in certain ways. And that's part of negotiating and meeting each other's needs in a relationship. It's learning how to fill each other's buckets in the way that works for the person, but also works for you as the delivery person of the needs. If a man says to you, you shouldn't need that, my first response would be, are you asking for a want or a need? If you're asking for a need, like your love is really important to me, safety is important to me, and a man says you shouldn't need that, I would simply respond with, I do, and it's a normal need. If he keeps trying to gas you off the need at that point, you probably don't want to be with that guy. Now, if it's a want you're talking about, let's say you go, I want a morning text every night, and a man says you shouldn't need that. Look, I don't like the way he's framing it. What I would say to him is instead you should be saying to her, or <laughs> you should be, what I would advise him to say to her is, that's not something I'd be able to do. However, I'm open to discussing different ways to meet your needs. 
That would be the response from the guy. If the guy gives you, well, I want this morning text, or I want flowers every Tuesday, or I want three date nights a week, and he says, you shouldn't need that, you are asking for a want here. However, the way he's pushed back on you is not ideal. I would recommend speaking it as, okay, would you be open to discussing different ways so that I can feel safe or secure? I.e. different ways to get that need met. Because it comes back to the need, guys. It's all about the need. So if he says you shouldn't need that and you're talking about a want, yeah, it's an ugly way he's phrased it. When it comes back to you, say, okay, my need for blank is important. If we can't do X, would you be open to figuring out different ways to get that need met? If he says, yes, I'm open to figuring out different ways, great. Now we're discussing different ways other than thrice weekly date nights or a morning text to get your need met. If he says, no, I'm not open to discussing any other ways to get your needs met, then either number one, most likely you're going to have to let that guy go because he's not open to meeting your needs. Or number two, there is a small possibility that it's your insecurities that are driving this and he's, all actually, he's actually already doing a really great job. And if it is your insecurities, then that's something you need to work on for yourself. Like let's say he's already doing three nights a week date nights with you and you want a fourth or he's already doing two plus a phone call and he's not available to do a third for several months um, he might say look babe this is all I can do here you know I, I can't meet your need for safety any more than this and you've then got to decide if you can live with that if, if you can live with that if you can cover that insecurity for yourself then you can keep seeing him but otherwise he's basically just gaslighted you off your needs and that is the video for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have a man in your life right now, I hope you don't have to use these. But if you do, I hope it was helpful for you. And if you don't have a man, remember, I've got my no man, no fee coaching guarantee. If you want to know how we find your man in the next three to six months, guaranteed, book a call. I'll explain how it works to you. Subscribe if you like the video. Give it a thumbs up. And thanks again for enjoying my work. I'll see you in the next video.